God, as we come to this time to remember the cross, as we take a little cracker that represents Jesus, your body, as we take a cup of juice that represents your blood, I pray that we would remember, that we would remember what you did on the cross on behalf of those who trust and believe in you. Please draw us near to you in this time that it would make much of you. And it's in your great name we pray. Amen. We are going to be passing out Bibles as we spend time in God's Word. We want to make sure that everybody has a copy of Word in front of you, whether it's a book or whether it's on your device or whatever. Please just raise your hand and uh, the men will hand out some Bibles. And as you are opening your Bibles, please open to Job chapter 37, verse 23. Job 37, verse 23. As you're turning there, I want you to consider a man who walks into a building and commits multiple murders. There are plenty of eyewitnesses and there's overwhelming evidence that ties this man to this, these murderous acts. He even confesses to having committed this crime. Now I want you to consider this man goes before a judge. And the judge declares him not guilty. What does your heart want to do in that kind of a situation? Cry out, that's wrong. That's unfair. That's unjust. The guilty have gone free. What is justice? In a legal sense, it's the right administration and application of law. It's giving someone what they deserve. And in a fallen world, injustice is something we have to deal with. However, not so in our dealings with God. Please follow along as I read Job 37, verse 23, or the second part of verse 23. He is exalted in power, and he will not do violence to justice and abundant righteousness. Here it's being said that God will not do violence to justice. He will not violate or oppress justice. One of the themes of the book of Job is Job's complaint against God for being unjust in his dealings with Job. Earlier in this book, Job declares, though I am guiltless, he, God, will declare me guilty. Job is convinced that he is suffering wrongly and that God has made a mistake. At the beginning of this book, God declares to Satan that Job is blameless and an upright man, fearing God and turning away from evil. And then Job suffers. And one day he loses his livelihood, his wealth, and his ten children. And another day he loses his health and is in immense pain. Job suffered material loss, familial loss, and physical loss. Job suffered greatly. And through all of this, Job never questioned that God was sovereign over all of these circumstances. However, Job and his three friends wrongly understood God's justice. They could only see these circumstances through the lens of a theology of retribution. The three three friends seeing Job's suffering could only conclude that Job must have sinned in some grievous way and he was deserving of this. Job sees these circumstances and concludes he's being punished for sins, but God is wrong. Job says, behold, I cry violence, but I get no answer. I shout for help, but there is no justice. But our verse says that he, God, will not do violence to justice. God was not punishing Job for some sin that he had done. And at the same time, 
God does not need to explain his ways to Job. Because God knows all things, he can perfectly dispense justice. He can perfectly give to everyone exactly what they deserve. Have you ever thought that God is dealing unjustly in this world? Have you ever thought that God is dealing unjustly with you? Romans 3 tells us that there is none righteous, there is no one who is good, there is not even one. Every single person is a sinner. That's God's assessment of mankind. That's God's assessment of all of us. What would ultimate justice look like for all of mankind? Justice would rightly be served if every single person suffered an eternity under the wrath of a holy God. That would be just. And that's not naturally what we want to hear. Where is the hope? Praise be to God that he provided a way to save sinners. A way that he would still be just and yet a way to justify sinners. And he did this by sending his perfect, innocent son into this world to go to the cross to be punished for their sins, the sins of others. Jesus was the substitute for all those that put their trust and faith in him, put their trust and faith in him alone. God is just, and he will punish every single sin. And that punishment is either endured by the sinner in hell or it was endured by Jesus on the cross. God is just and the justifier of the one that has faith in Jesus. If you would, by your own admission, say that you don't have faith in Christ and you haven't trusted him alone for the forgiveness of your sins, then we ask that you would simply, when the the trays come by, that you would just simply pass those by. But know this, you are a sinner, and you will have to deal with God's justice. And you will receive what you're due. And I beg you to, to turn from your sin, turn to Christ, turn right now. Turn to the forgiveness that's offered at the cross. If... You want to know, if you have any questions about what that looks like, what that means, please come talk to me or any one of the other pastors or the person that brought you, but don't wait. If you're with us today and you're a believer, but your heart has become hardened by sin, then please confess that sin, repent, and turn right now, and turn and join us. Believer, as you consider God's justice, You are the guilty one. You rightly deserve punishment for your sins. But because of Jesus' body and blood at the cross, the judge declares you not guilty. Not guilty. When your hearts are prepared, please take communion on your own.